Oh, from New York, New York, you are listening to Extra Time, presented by AT&T 5G. I am Andrew Wiebe with my partners in soccer, Charlie Davies. The estate is in disrepair. We've got an issue with the sprinklers, folks. He might be in and out on this show. We don't know. <laughs> David Goss, an honorary partner for this show and for always in our hearts and minds. Tommy Scoops, Tom Boger. Got a big show coming up. The secondary transfer window is open. It is wide open. Nothing is slamming shut yet. We are throwing it open. The deals are happening. Many that were rumored, many that were reported, and many are now getting over the finish line uh, when it comes to press releases and official team tweets, etc., we're going to talk about it all. That's why Tommy is here. But we are going to start with a topic that Charlie just brought up, and uh, it piqued my interest. Because we're excited, man. Transfer window opens. You see moves. Your team's improving. New stars are coming in. <gasps> Best. Oh, <gasps> my God. We just traded for a player. We just acquired a yeah, player. Yeah, ditch this so guy. But then better. Charlie's Love like, it. yeah, but in the locker room. And I didn't even think about in the locker room. Like, if you're Bryce Duke, and you see Alejandro Pozuelo coming, and everybody's like, we're... We're making the playoffs, baby. You're like, yeah, but I, hey, guys, I was doing pretty good. Uh, Charlie, what's it like with this day in the locker room? As you see rumors happening, as you see moves happening, as you see maybe your place in the pecking order get uh, shuffled, so to speak, how do players think about the transfer window? Well, there there are two kind of sides to the coin, right? So the, the first is for the, the players in the locker room and that this player is not coming to replace, and they're thinking – Yes, let's go. Another playmaker, facilitator, someone who's going to connect passes, someone who's going to help us in the attacking third, the piece we've been missing. Meanwhile, there's the player who's been playing that position. And you're thinking, oh, man, what am I? Am I invisible? Have I not been going out there and, and producing? I think I've been playing well. I'm progressing, yet everybody seems really happy that this guy is going to be coming in to play over me. And so then you have the, the teammates who are friends with that player typically will be like, hey, I mean, you, you, at least you enjoyed it while you, while you played, you know? <laughs> you, you had a good run. You had a good run. There's, there's no encouragement <laughs> of like, you can still do it. Like, just keep uh, playing just, at that level. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there, there will be – it's a mix. It's a mix of a, a, of emotions from from different players. There's the ones that give you the banter, you know. Hey, you did a good job while, you, while filling in. You know, <laughs> now now you can watch. Now you can you can you can continue to just learn from Pozuelo, and you know you'll be ready down the line. Then you have the players who, you know, the older veterans who come in and say, "Hey, stick with it. Like keep focus. You've done so well this year. Your your time is coming. This doesn't this doesn't mean that you're not going to be the guy here. Like just keep pushing." And then you have the guys who are like, man, I, I need we need Pozuelo to play 90 minutes every game. Like, he's the game changer. And you're like, okay, I, I see I see how you feel. <laughs> oh, mixed emotions. Mixed mm -hmm. emotions. But it's all fun. Uh, one of the best times of the year, this summer transfer window around the world. Certainly in MLS, we're going to talk about it all. Uh, right now, coming up today from the AT&T 5G Virtual Studios, uh, Toronto FC. Busy, busy, busy. We mentioned Alejandro Pozuelo traded 150K in GAM and some additional uh, considerations. Tom will help us understand on that one. Federico Bernadeschi reportedly in on a free as well. They're targeting Mark Anthony K. Lorenzo Insigne is there, but he's not going to play. Not for a couple weeks at least. What is happening in Toronto? We will lay that out. Uh, what's happening in, in Miami? Well, they're not playing FIFA 22 anymore, according to Phil Neville. A hell of a quote. From the gaffer, we'll go into what's going on with Chris Henderson and the boys. The Galaxy have a new uh, midfielder. It's not Pozuelo. Uh, it, it might be Jesse Lingard. Down, down, I don't know, man. Jesse Lingard to MLS. That's uh, blowing my mind right now. We'll figure out how much of that is real and much, much more, including Heineken Rivalry Week preview. A big weekend in MLS. ESPN doubleheader on Friday. Philly DC starts it. Then El Trafico ends it. Maybe Bale. Maybe Kalini. Maybe others. I don't know. We'll see. Jimmy Conrad's going to do a watch on Twitch and YouTube Live. It's going to be a one-man band on that one. Of course, you'll watch on ESPN as well. Saturday, NYC Revs starts at Cascadia Cup on Fox in the afternoon. Charlotte, Nashville, Orlando, Miami, Houston, Dallas, RSL, Colorado to end the night. And we have a watch along there with uh, Sasha Kleschen, Charlie Davies, and your own Tom Bogert. So tune in on that one. All right. Transfer window. It's open. Tommy Scoops, Toronto FC. What the hell's going on, man? <laughs> I, can't, I can't do the wind horse bit. I'd love to. I was thinking about going, what? <laughs> is happening in Toronto. We're all looking at 
Lorenzo and Senior. But Bob get Bradley. Up, get the fingers yeah, up. With Bob Bradley, and, and they're just doing their own thing. The fingers are going around. It, it, it's their own sideshow. They have a mind of their own. But yeah, look, <laughs> truly a lot's going around in Toronto. And, and the reason why the, the wind horse bit doesn't work for this one is we're all watching. Nobody was sitting and not watching it. This would be like if you asked me about Toronto. And I'm like, but what is happening in Nashville? That's what people are asking. Uh, yeah, so no, Toronto are continuing the roster evolution. Um, it, it's it's pretty wild that the swings that they're trying to take look like Carlos Salcedo is on the outs as well. They're trying to trying to get rid of him to open up another DP spot. Part of that is is a family emergency that he was in in Mexico for, and part of it is just flatly hasn't been very good for Toronto. Um, and it'd be more useful for them to have another DP spot. Alejandro Pozuelo didn't fit the system very well for Bob Bradley, and Bob Bradley even kind of put his name on a quote where it was like, yeah, of course he's he's still creating chances because we, we've bent the team to suit him and let him do whatever we want, give him freedom. It was like the, the meanest compliment ever where he's like, yeah, you know, he's creating chances, but, and then just kind of shredded him for everything he's doing when he's not creating chances. So this felt like a long time coming. Pozuelo, I, I almost felt bad for him because every single time he's been asked, in the offseason and during the season, he's been like, I want to stay in Toronto. I want to be with Toronto. I want my long-term future to be here. And every time Bill Manning and Bob Bradley was asked, it was, we're going to make that decision later. We're not sure yet. And Bob Bradley even kind of took to jumping in when the question was being asked to say, I know what you're asking me. I'm not talking about Alejandro's kind of contract option or, or, or his contract, his future. So yeah, a lot of things are happening. Um, it makes a lot more sense for Fernando Bernadeschi to be coming in on the wing. And Michael Singh says it's happening. Uh, Fabrizio Romano says it, it, it's almost there. It seems a lot like that one's happening. He fits so much better into a 43-3 with, uh, than Alejandro Pozuelo does. Um, and they're trying, again, they're trying to get rid of Carlos Salcedo, which would open up another DP spot. They are interested in Mark Anthony K. but I was told pretty flatly earlier in the week, nothing's imminent. He's, he's, he, they fully expect him to be playing against Real Salt Lake for Colorado Rapids. The Rapids want to be active. Everybody has a price, but, but right now, what I was told a few days ago is nothing was imminent. So look, there are a lot of moving parts. Toronto are taking a lot of big swings. Maybe they'll look at and see if there's any more Italian internationals who are out of contract currently. Andrea Pelotti is, uh, but you know, we'll kind of see where it goes from there. But they're, they're must watch this offseason, this offseason, this, this summer. So we knew, I think we've talked about it on this show for a while, right? Pasuelo didn't make sense in the system. He doesn't make sense really with Insigne. I guess what would be frustrating to me if I was a Toronto fan is it feels like the Insigne signing was done before Bob Bradley really took control. And we he obviously would have had some influence, but not a ton. And then you ran it up to the buzzer in which you got no value for Pasuelo. And I think that's a frustrating piece. My first reaction to this is, one, congrats, Inter Miami. You got all 100 Pasuelo for 150000 in allocation money. You just, <laughs> Philly Union, to Inter Miami in Toronto for you, right? They, and that's what Carranza was because Philly, for Miami had to get off him. But I think there, there should be a level of frustration out of Toronto that this was one of the all-time yeah. largest signings in MLS history. And while he won an MVP, he now goes, he now leaves to an Eastern conference rival for 150,000. Yeah. I mean, I mean the, the value for Toronto was getting out of the DP spot. I think everything you said is correct, by the way, but I, I'm not, who else was going to be bidding for Alejandro Pozuelo, whose contract is expiring. Uh, hold on. In, Why in not the Gal? Like, I guess the galaxy couldn't cause they did the Costa, but like, <sighs> There's not another team in MLS that wouldn't say for 150k we'll go rental on this. The Portland Timbers can't figure out a so, way to well, make that yeah. happen. Uh, like, I, I mean, again, d- uh, sure, what about the maybe, Rapids? But I don't. He doesn't really stylistically fit them. Like Miami was kind of the perfect storm of this guy kind of fits perfectly. We can wait you out, Toronto. It's more, if we know you're talking to Bernadeschi and you need that DP spot open, it's extremely more likely that you'll find a taker for Pozuelo than it would be for Carlos Salcedo. So, like, they had all the leverage. And, two, like, look at what Giassi's artist got traded for. And, and again, like, he hasn't been great in Colorado so far, but but we were talking in the winter, maybe this will be a million in game or, or whatever it is. And it comes down to 300000 because he's out of contract at the end of the year. Like, there was no leverage for Toronto here. Like, I, this deal wasn't about yeah. them getting 150000 in allocation money. No, it was about them a opening a DP spot. Sure. But that's still poor planning, right? The fact that they put themselves in this place. And yeah. I thought it would be outside the league because of everything you just said. It feels like his contract was so large that other teams outside the league couldn't afford him. And then he said, well, mm. then I'll play it out, right? I'm not going to leave early. And then they kind of got stuck. Now, at the same time, getting Bernadeschi on a free contract is a great deal. And it feels like it all fits together better. So as much as I, I'm saying they should have gotten more, should have ran 
the whole thing probably a little bit better. I believe the team is better today than they were yesterday if Bernadeschi does sign and whenever Insigne is healthy, which maybe so now we much, start going down that road. How much is more to come on this, positive. Tom? And, I mean, look, shout out to the transfer market and the players out of contract in <laughs> Serie A section uh, for Toronto FC. But, like, how much – what, what's more to come here? Or is this, like, sort of the sum of parts for – Toronto, is Mark Anthony K actually realistic? Do they actually want to try to make a deal like that? Do they have allocation money that would allow them to? Like, what, what is Bob? What is Bob going for down the line here? I, I have no idea where the allocation money would come from. Uh, maybe if if they bring some up from next season, like, look, they they have a lot of bad contracts that were from previous regimes. Like, they're still paying a lot of Kamar Lawrence's salary charge, and he doesn't play for them anymore. Like, they they've kind oh. of tried to max out everything to be competitive and gut everything and and rebuild and kickstart the rebuild as best they could but they i, I don't know where the allocation was going to come from mark anthony k is signed through 2025 with an option for 2026 uh the rapids acquired him for a million in gam plus um an international slot and the value for trades has only gone up since then like over the winter paul Ariola went for two million um, Lewis Morgan went for a lot and all these other trades that, that set new market with Kellen Acosta for up to 1.6 million. That's what we're looking at here. And this is a team like, again, uh, Colorado want to be active. They want to change things. They're not happy with where things are, but they're not just going to give up on, on Mark Anthony Kane and be like, well, the, the kind of the best 11, um, stats that you showed under Bob Bradley LFC for the, what you showed at the beginning of your time in Colorado, just because things aren't working, they're not going to give them up for 800,000. And I, I'm not sure where the money is. My question would be, do they really need Mark Anthony K? Because if I'm looking at, uh, well, yes. you have Osorio. They do. They do. He's not going to play in that role. Osorio is a is a better attacking midfielder, and and I'd say I'd argue just in possession than Mark Anthony K. He's not going to play over Michael Bradley. That's for damn sure. And then you're looking at Ralph Preso, and Ralph Preso, he's one of those players that's in a, a Weston McKinney for me. If if I was to say if there's one player that kind of images uh mirror images what Wes mckinney is is doing probably as a younger Wes mckinney that would be ralph preso in my opinion so wouldn't you allow him to continue to develop because if you're looking at mark anthony k and ralph preso there's not a massive gap there's not a massive gap at all and ralph preso can close that I gap know. with 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 time that's and a little so disrespectful saying, to mark anthony k <laughs> okay okay would would okay. you would you pay uh, would you pay that so much money to bring him in what, over over developing Ralph Preso? That's my question. I think I, that, that's, their biggest that's issue is the back line. Is the so, back line? Their center backs. That is Toronto's problem. That is where. But they have a DP center back, and you talked about the mm -hmm. deals they're stuck on. Chris Mavinga's on a massive deal that I've heard no one else in MLS can even get around because it just makes no sense on the contract he's on. So. Charlie, I think the issue is, yeah. Uh, so one, I think Mark Anthony K is a starter for this team. I agree with you about developing uh, Preso, but Insigne is going to be 31, right? It's win now. It is not. Now's your chance, Ralph. The last five months was his chance to win the spot. He's had injuries, which sucks. So has Noble Akello. I think that window has closed pretty much on that. Although I will say Mark Anthony K is more flexible then Jonathan Osorio in terms of playing next to Michael or in front of him, quote unquote, because let's be real, Bernadeschi and Insigne and Jimenez and Akinola, that's your attack. Like the guys coming out of midfield are not going to be a key part of breaking teams down. I also think when you look at everything that's going on, that Jonathan Osorio has to be an asset that TFC can look around the league and say, can we cover some of either Mark Anthony K's trade or just, paying for all of this, uh, all these other guys. Exactly. For a guy, he's going to be out of contract at the end of this year. So I don't know that TFC can get, but I don't know that TFC can guarantee they can bring him back. So if I'm another team, why don't I, that, that either needs him or wants to bring him in and sell him on my project. And I'm looking at teams probably lower down in the table or teams that aren't going to spend big money outside of MLS. I've been looking at San Jose the whole time as one of those teams. Why would you not go out, bring him in? And maybe it's, it, I don't think it's going to be in the package that Jonathan Osorio's quality deserves when you look at Casper Shabilko going for $1.1 in allocation. I think it's going to reflect his age and his contract status, but you could still get 500000 600000 like, or to something not, with to, escalators. To, 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 I strongly, to I strongly disagree. <laughs> and then bring no, it back. Not, you don't think I'm so, Tom? I, I, yeah, and, and that, again, and I strongly disagree just in, in the sense of how much money you could get. Again, he's out of contract. He's 
We just talked about this with Alejandro Pozuelo. I know it's different circumstances given you don't need a DP charge for, for Jonathan Osorio. But it, for him, like, I, I'm not sure why he would sign up to not go to free agency, be it an MLS or go abroad. Like, why would he commit his future 100% to whoever trades for him right now? You could be open to staying longer. But then why would the team that's acquiring him? And again, who are you bidding against? How is this going to get to three, four, five hundred? 500? Like, people look at Pozuelo. People can look at other, you know, the Jossie's artists. Like, how can you get more than 300000 for a player who's out of contract and has made it known that, like, hey, like, I, I'd be open. I've always wanted to go to Europe. I've always wanted to try myself. And or for Osorio, again, if, if you want to stay in MLS, stay in Toronto, stay wherever you want, like, why would you not test free agency where teams are, are giving out bigger deals starting last year? And because and there's more player movement, there's people are realizing the value of kind of domestic MLS lifer guys like Walker Zimmerman just got a huge contract. I, Aaron Long is going to get he's going to have a lot of options this, this offseason when he's out of contract. So I'm just not sure what that market would be. You're spot on. All right, well, that was a heated discussion of a potential Jonathan Osorio trade. Meanwhile, there you is a trade that appears to be computer. happening. I know, just shut you straight yeah. down. Just pushed you me off. And, me and Charlie are purgatory. Ethered, David Goss. Did, did they make good <laughs> points, <laughs> Weeby? Because I couldn't even hear. Yeah, I think they did make good did points. Did they make the point um, that San Jose went to Jimmy Montero for 450000 in allocation? So why Not doing this right now, Goss. They, they, not doing they, this they right now, okay, cool. We did you, make that point also not to you missed, win You missed your chance. To not compete okay, cool. for, for, for anything. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we'll, we'll see. We'll see what happens. Uh, we have one thing to talk about Toronto more as well, but I mentioned it there. Are, if you if you see Tom either on your screen or you hear his distance on this podcast, uh, Sergio Santos appears to be in Cincinnati on his way from the Union to FC Cincinnati. So uh, young Tom, Tommy Scoops here, is uh, chasing down some, some details live as we record this. Uh, Dave, I'll, I'll throw it back to you on this one. We haven't really talked about Federico Bernadeschi very much and the level of signing that is for Toronto. Last five years at Juve, not as good as the years at Fiorentina as far as production goes, but playing for obviously a much more ambitious side, a side for, that's playing for more. What do you make of this signing by Toronto? I think it's a better fit on the field with Insigne. Um, and it's obviously a younger player as well. So you may be actually if he can come in and settle in, because you mentioned he hasn't played a ton over the last few years and he hasn't been as effective, um, it could be more of a long-term fit. But you look at a guy who, uh, dominant left foot, but silky with both feet, can beat players 1v1, I think can play on both sides because he can come inside onto either foot, but is lethal with his left foot when he gets there. Uh, and the one nice thing is, for a club that just signed Jefferson Satelda, who we thought would be a 1v1 demon and all this, he's about a foot taller with a little bit more muscle on him. So maybe he can <laughs> hang in MLS a little bit more comfortably. Um, it's one of those where we could talk about all the little specifics of the spots of the field he wants to pick up and how it affects Bob Bradley's system. You're talking about a full Italian international. You're talking about talent. And I think if you put talent on the field and let them figure it out, it all makes sense. Obviously, there's that Italian national team bent to what TFC is doing and how they promote themselves in the market, which they must feel worked well enough with Javinko that it's worth going back to that. Well, um, I don't see a ton of drawbacks in this move that I can understand there being some question marks, but you're talking about an elite world player uh, who can be a difference maker. All right. So Toronto are, are very busy. I believe you called it an evolution, Tom. It feels like the second teardown for them. They're just making all sorts of moves, trying to get it to be Bob Bradley's team. Chris Henderson has already done his teardown. Now he's building, building, building with some constraints on him. Uh, talk me through the the standpoint for Miami for Pozuelo. You know what? How long they were working on this? Uh, what the additional fee might be after the 150k in GAM, which seems impossibly low. Uh, and also tell me what the press conference was like today. Cause Phil Neville quote said, we're not playing FIFA 22 anymore. We're actually going through a process, which Yikes. is a hell of a quote. That's a, a, it that was is a, a phenomenal quote. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it, the, it's pretty obvious from Miami side. And this is even when I was kind of reaching out to sources after this was, was all done. I was like, look, uh, for me on the outside, it, it's, I know you guys were looking for an elite chance creator. You wanted a number 10. Um, with this profile, with this with this open BTP spot. And just as a sidebar, 
they've played really well this year while under sanctions, while trying to get rid of a lot of bad decisions, a lot of pieces didn't fit, and they've gotten nothing out of three DP spots. And this was supposed to be the glamour into Miami who had a bunch of DP spots. So I think that that's something that, that we should be kind of crediting the club, Phil Neville, the players, all that. Um, but in, in terms, I was reaching out, talking to people like, it seems obvious, like you wanted a chance creator. Um, he fits really well. It, it, it's it's great with Gregory and John Mata as, as a midfield trio. You have runners both on the wings and and the wing backs, specifically DeAndre Yedlin, Leo Campagna playing as, as kind of a, pro, a target traditional center forward, whatever you want to call it in terms of, of, of appointment. Like that spacing all makes a ton of sense. And from kind of what people are like, yeah, like that that's it on face value. It's pretty much all that. Another thing I will add is that there's. He, Chris Henderson on the press conference today kind of kind of said that that Pozuelo is super happy to be there, and that's another place that he that he would like to kind of continue his career. I know we were I was joking a little bit before that he was saying that about Toronto and Toronto were just completely non-committal with him. Well, Miami are doing the same thing already. Uh, they were kind of asked, "Hey, is there kind of a long-term agreement here?" And it was, "Hey, you know, we have these three players out on loan or in the process, wherever it is, Julian Carranza." Uh, Rodolfo Bizarro and um, Mati Pellegrini, and we, we we need to wait on decisions from other clubs about them before we can kind of commit. We don't know if we're going to have what RTP spots will look like. My assumption is is that they're going to have all three open before Pozuelo, because I can't possibly imagine that they're going to pick up Gonzalo Higuain's option. I can't imagine that they're going to go into year two of having Rodolfo Bizarro count as a DP while he's not at the club, and I'm just assuming that Carranza is going to stay in Philly, or if he doesn't, they'll find another solution for that. So all of the above, it just makes so much sense. Um, they 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 were interested. They had some talks with Mario Goza. When that was happening, I was told he wasn't their top target. I don't know if that means Alejandro Pozuelo was. I know that they've liked him. They, they knew that this was a possibility for about a month that he was available. It was going to be pretty cheap, good value, a good fit, all this. Uh, I know that they were considering kind of a younger option in terms of this either DP spot or a high TAM in terms of a number 10, but Pozuelo makes so much sense in that when his visa goes through, he's he's going to be ready to play. He's, he's fit. He's in season. He's been in MLS, obviously a former MVP. His debut season was absolutely electric as well. I, I believe he won newcomer of the year. If he didn't, he should have, whatever it was. Um, this is a guy that they know is MLS proven. They know he fits in the league. They know like Phil Neville is kind of going on this, this um, retelling that he when he was telling the team that Pozuelo was coming like so, previously when they played against him a couple guys were like that's the best player I've played against in this league like when he's on he's an elite player in this league and obviously there are questions about his, his fitness or his fit or whatever in, in Toronto whatever you want to say I think that the fit is perfect in Miami and again worst case scenario they they spend 150,000 wipe their hands of it in the offseason and he's gone like this is so low risk this is a new move that they were doing this is not going to hamper them whether it goes great or whether it goes poorly um and another reason why they wanted somebody in this age why they why they liked Pozuelo in this age profile they're legitimately in a playoff race like they could realistically make the playoffs which is something that most on the outside i don't know what they were thinking internally but most on the outside didn't think was really possible to be in the season um so Pozuelo helps it, with that playoff chase given all of that stuff and look they do like bryce duke i know Weeby did an awful bryce duke impersonation to start the show but this is somebody who's <laughs> not gonna i guess completely block him he's not gonna be in the best 11 but he's somebody who could play behind Pozuelo. and again Pozuelo is you know 30 or 31 whatever it is this isn't a 23 year old who's gonna be here for the next decade it's important on this show um Tom, that you know the exact age of any player that you're talking about, as well as their birth date and when they may transition into an older age. So we'll let that one pass, but in the future, uh, jump on that. I think Jesse Lingard's 29. Is that right? Anybody Can anybody confirm or deny? He is he, Charlie, what do you think? Jesse Lingard to MLS, to the Galaxy, to yes. LAFC, to a, a warm coastal city of some sort, You know, assuming that maybe you know Barcelona or Milan don't sign him. He's on a free mm -hmm. for Manchester United. Twelman says the Galaxy are 100% in on trying to sign Jesse Lingard, which they're going to have to do a little well, gymnastics as yeah, far as I the mean, roster goes to they, figure that out. But They need to be, Weeby, because if you're looking at their crosstown rival in LAFC, and I've just re recently wrote an article on, on El Trafico coming up, but um, if, you, if you're going to check this out and see LAFC, top of the table, top of the supporter shield standings, and only strengthening their chances of bringing a trophy home, bringing Gareth Bale, bringing in Giorgio Chiellini. That, that's the type of, of talent that you want to see. And, and they still have an open DP spot. For the Galaxy, you have Chicharito, who's 34. You have Douglas Costa, who's been a flop so far, and, and he's in his 30s. So you're thinking, we need to bring some energy to this group. We need another facilitator, someone who can 
who can get on the ball, who's, who's confident, who gives us a little bit swagger, some, some excitement around this team. You had Zlatan Ibrahimovic, and when I hear groundbreaking, groundbreaking, there's nothing groundbreaking about Jesse Lingard. It's great that he's 29. There's a lot of clubs in, in Europe, some of the bigger names that want him. But in terms of the actual deal itself, there's nothing groundbreaking there. You've had David Beckham. You've had Zlatan Ibrahimovic. Nothing will be more than that. Nothing more groundbreaking than that type of signing. But I think what's great about the Galaxy is we're going to target someone that we're competing with the Syria, top Serie A clubs of the world, the, the, the top uh, La Liga clubs of the world, other Premier League clubs. We're getting the chance to sign a really influential player and who has 32 caps, who is someone who can really change the game for us. So I love that about the Jesse Lingard signing. But it still doesn't fix some of their issues. And again, the back line has been been really problematic. And considering that, they're still in striking distance. So if they can figure out, okay, let's add Jesse Lingard, but let's also address our defense, this Galaxy team can go from, uh, we're just going to be a playoff team to, oh no, we're going to go for the cup too. You LAFC, yeah, you can go for it, but we're also coming, which, which I enjoy. I By love. the way, Friday, El Trafico, ESPN. Yeah, this is the best. Okay. If you're not watching on YouTube, Tom went we're seeing woes. how the sausage is made. Yeah. yeah. Shams, whoa, he's on the phone. He's looking out the window. He's peering around in the parking lot. He's making, <laughs> I don't even know where he went now. He needs some privacy. He doesn't know if the mute button works here on uh, on the extra time recording. <laughs> is Jesse Lingard realistic, though, Dave? Well, is it, is like, or is this just something that like that we file in the rumors section that we like to talk about and it's fun and the LA teams are involved and you know he just left Man U et cetera or or is this just sort of a pipe dream? I mean the reporting is that he's over here, um, so if he's going to meet with teams then yeah it's realistic LAFC has an open DP spot they've talked about an attacking player and he fits across the front three as all three of those players do because they can all play all those positions so there's like not a ton of concern. For tactically um, flexibility for LAFC for the galaxy. Charlie's not wrong. They'd be better if they brought in Jesse Lingard. They did bring in Gaston Brugman, who it sounds like uh, as a D mid to try and help that back line a little bit more. And it feels like they probably won't play with an attacking midfielder. Um, they'll have basically three guys on the field who can help cover for the back line. I, I don't know what the galaxy are doing overall. Um, they can't get out of Cabral and Costa, probably. Uh, they definitely can't do it right now. I kind of feel like just take your lumps with those two, get out of the year, buy out Douglas Costa, and figure out the rest. I don't know that bringing Jesse Lingard in today and then scrambling to get out of Douglas Costa is the right solution. It feels a lot like a Galaxy team that had four DPs and gave away Gio Dos Santos again. Um but they'd be better as a club with him on the field. I mean, he'll be good in MLS. He won't be the best player that's ever come to this league. He may not be the best player in the league right now with Gareth Bale coming in and Insigne and other guys like that. Uh, but he'll score a ton of goals, as we saw with West Ham. He can play in a few different spots. And as Charlie said, he's an English national team player, right? He comes from Man U. He's got a level of swagger and a level of confidence that the Galaxy don't possess right now. Is it is it real? Anything about this, Tom, now that we've got you back? Or do you have news to break? Uh, One of the two. No, I, sorry. I, I, I don't know if you were continuing there. Yeah, I mean, look, there's no reason to doubt the original report from ESPN and then the update from Taylor Twelman signifying that both of these teams are taking a swing. Um, I, I would point out that this, again, the original report did sound a little bit like a negotiating ploy in terms of you know what I mean? How many times have we seen the headline from Europe that it's like, hey, you know, we have we have MLS offers. Hey, Everton and West Ham, we have M we we could do this. So look, I, I again, Taylor Twelman confirming it makes it makes it real. But but we'll, I don't know where Lingard's head is at in terms of again how how much he wants us, or again if he's just trying to get some more money out of the Everton and West Ham stuff. I, I kind of echo a lot what Dave was saying of what of what I caught there in terms of he's he scored a ton of goals. This this is a signing that if you can pull it off, you pull it off. He's he's Again, I think a really good player just because he didn't like going back to that season with West Ham is more indicative of what he is. And that was whatever, two years ago. And then he, they, Manchester United wanted him back and didn't play him for whatever reason. Well, for, I don't know why they brought him back if they weren't going to play him. But again, like this would be, uh, again, an in prime 
huge signing by an MLS club. And, and if you're uh, able to do it, if you need to have like sunk cost and Douglas cost or whatever it is for the galaxy, if you're LAFC and you're like, screw it, I don't care if we just got these players, let's swing for the fences and, and do everything we can. You do it. I, I would, I would add though, he's probably motivated if, if I'm in Jesse Lingard's shoes and I have six months to make a, the world cup team. And if it looks like I'm out of favor, regardless of where I go and where I play, because you're looking at Jude Bellingham, Mason Mount, Phil Foden, you know, you, you could go down the list. Yeah. Bakari, Bakai Osaka. So if you, if you have all these players who are clearly in front of you and aren't going anywhere unless they're injured, now now's your time to make that move to say, all right, I'm ready for a new project. And But you use the word motivated. I Saying I'm out of the England motivated national team conversation. Motivated for a World Cup space, for a spot on that team. You think he Not comes to LA to Galaxy play. and plays for a spot in the England national team? No, that's my point. If he sees that he's not going to be a real option for the English national team, for this World Cup, then he's not going to stay in England. I think he would only make a move to stay in Europe if that was a realistic ch- shot for him Got it. in the next six months. So If it's not, not worry, which then? I don't think it is then he will go to a place where he thinks he'll have the best um, balance of, of being a professional as well as enjoying life. And I think that would be the move to, to MLS for him. Cause he's still, it's not that you're coming to MLS to vacate, to have a vacation. You still got to come here and produce and show up. But I think in terms of the next club, if he's not going to have a realistic chance of making that English national team, a world cup, then you 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 say all right let let me try something different something that I'd be interested in and I think coming to MLS is exactly what um, would would kind of kind of move the needle for him. If it happened, I'll be excited. So I'll come on this show and be excited. But this just feels regressive for the Galaxy. Wow, this random player wants to live in LA. That's the plan now. Lay out a plan. <laughs> Follow the plan. And I know they just hired a new head of scouting and there hopefully will be more of it. But uh, this doesn't excite me because this feels like we're going back in time for the galaxy. Is it going back in time or is it just like stasis? Yeah, true. They never same moved has, into the new era of MLS. Stay the same <laughs> as it has been for a long time. I mean, that, that's like the definition of the Douglas Costa side. But he's three years can... younger than Robbie Keane, right? MLS has changed. So now that's a change for them. I'd say Robbie Keane. If if they could do it, they got to do it. They're in a, especially in the situation with Costa, Costa and and Cabral. Cabral less so than Costa. It just, we probably Anders is queuing up like all of us excited about Douglas Costa when the signing was made, but now it that just feels absolutely like the the worst possible decision they could have made. (laughs) No production and and hamstrings them on the cap and the roster. I think it was more exciting before we were told it was a DP contract. Charlie, I don't think he's on a different level than Robbie Keane, by the way. So Okay. Just just throwing that out there. All right. uh, Do you want to report something here, Tom? I mean, if you break Jesse Lingard signing news right now, you've been back here by the the sliding double doors of your closet, uh, childhood closet for uh, long (laughs) periods during this discussion. Can we how about we just throw it in now? We we had a tweet uh, here that was about um, possible guys around the league, a la Pozuelo, quality players that kind of fallen out of favor. Who would do best with the intra league transfer and where that's from Mike. Vermaland, and then Pat Brennan over at the Cincy Enquirer reported this morning, and many have followed up on it, and I'm sure Tom is just frustrated now. Have you tweeted, Tom? Yes. You, you got a tweet out? Okay. Pat yeah. Brennan originally reported that uh, news in the works, per multiple league sources, Cincy is moving toward finalizing a trade with Philly for Sergio Santos in exchange for GAM, and then uh, it was reported by, I believe, Jonathan Tannenwald that Sergio Santos is indeed in, in, the, in the Queen City, in Cincinnati, and you are now reporting what, because I haven't seen your tweet. Yeah, the <clears throat> deal's all agreed. It's being finalized, and, and like Tanner Walt said, he's there. Um, Philly will receive 300000 in GAM up front, and then there is a complex incentives package that in that goes up to a million, and not to get kind of too in the weeds from what I've kind of been told by multiple sources is that some of the incentives is performance-based for this season. A, another a chunk of the incentives is if he re-signs with FC Cincinnati, and then furthermore on performance-based incentives 
after he resigns, if he does resign. So Philly are getting 300,000 up front, and then they could get another 700,000 to make this a $1 million uh, gam uh, expense. Now, if, if you're looking at this move, and Cincinnati are, are, are top four in the Eastern Conference for goals four, Philly are 10. And you could argue that they're st- they still haven't found their striker yet, even though uh, Mikel Ua has has shown flashes here and there. But Do it, Charlie. They're, they're still it. not not doing it. <laughs> um, is this a, a a backup plan for for Brenner and, and Vasquez? Is do they expect him to play a, a different role or or? And then what does Philly do? You're moving a striker. I would I, w- I would argue <laughs> that they need to bring in one. So is that the plan? I I I think I've got a lot of thoughts here from weeks and of reporting and understanding on this stuff, and not specific to the Sergio Santos deal. So again, I guess I guess these things could change. But just from my foundation of knowledge from what I've heard from both of these teams, first of all, the Cincy. Brandon Vasquez, I believe, is out of contract at the end of the season. There have been rumors for him with Chivas. I guess that's kind of insurance for him or whatever it is. I, Pat Brennan would have had more up-to-the-date info. He, he said, you shouldn't read into this in terms of Brenner and Vasquez or any other strikers for this team, but it's impossible not to. Um, with okay. Brenner, as of as of a month ago, I would have been. I was thinking he was almost definitely going to leave. Um, that changes after you score five goals in over a couple games or, or whatever his, re- his return was. Um, there, the relationship between him and the club was fractured as i've said on the show before you know i i think that's been repaired he definitely still has teams interested in him in, in europe and obviously brazil um i don't know where since he stand on on this whether they want to open that dp spot or they think hey this is the whole reason why we rejected offers for you in the winter is because we believed you with lucho and and vasquez was going to be an elite attack under pat newton's system so that's kind of the since side on the philly side Charlie, you're not wrong. They've kind of, they've struggled for goals. They've struggled for that difference maker. Um, I think I'd push back. I, I like Sergio Santos as a player. I, I think that his his good combo of, of work rate, pace, uh, directness, all of this. But look, like I think that we know the Sergio Santos story. He's not gonna be like if he's your starting striker for Philly. That's not gonna be good enough either. Um, they they could use the depth, but they do have a couple of this again. Mikel Ura, Julian Carranza. Those those are two people that I think will start. Jim Curtin has been saying, and people that I've talked to around the club over this U20 tournament, it was like, you know, we 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 truly believe that Jim and the coaching staff are going to turn more and more to this next wave of homegrowns. Like, we, they already knew they were ready, um, but it's been difficult to get the minutes on the field. You look at Paxton Aronson, Quinn Sullivan, Jack McGlynn. I think that these guys are going to feature in a lot more now that they're back from, from the US U20s. So that makes Sergio Santos expendable. And then you look at the price, 300000 up front for a player who could have been leaving at the end of the year. And plus, whatever incentives come in, that's pretty good. So I think that that makes sense for Philly. Again, you're right to point out that they they need all the, the kind of the attacking options they can get. But I think my own personal pushback, and this is nothing that that has been directly said to me by by the club, but my own personal pushback is, I think the Philadelphia Union know the Sergio Santos story, and I think that they're ready to get off this ride in terms of hoping that he turns into this 20 a goal season score. I don't. Could any of those young guys move though? Because you're talking about Pac- wait Man, before before we like, go there. I just I still don't get it from Cincinnati. It, it, it is, it, you know, th- again, if, if you don't trade for somebody, if you don't see them long-term or hope that the best case scenario hits. So the best case scenario hits, that, like, like you said, that, that's a million, that, is, that would be a million in, in incentives. And, and again, like you said, they, attacking isn't the issue for them. So I'm sure it was a little bit of, again, this is a Philadelphia player with the Philadelphia, uh, Chris Albright, who worked uh, the Philadelphia Union, Pat Noonan, who worked with the Philadelphia yeah, Union. Albright There's just, familiarity there. They have a number of Philly players, former Philly players already, but... Yeah, um, I don't know. The attack isn't the issue for them. Yeah. It, it would be kind of more defense. But Feels like insurance. I, yeah, I think that's the best way to put it. Should we get some other deals? Yes. How uh, about and- Washington Carrozo to, to Austin? How do we feel about that one on loan? Dave, what do you think? I'm stoked about it. I, he was one of those guys in CCL that you watched and were like, hmm, what's his contract situation? When, Where could this guy end up? I, inconsistency is his problem. So it, this is not a guarantee of any sort. Um, and there's a decent chance that he shows up, doesn't perform, and falls out of the radar and isn't a part of this team. But they got a six-month loan to sort of test him out before they decide if they want to bring him in permanently. I do think he adds an element to their attack. I thought when you watch the Rapids game this weekend specifically, Finley was a huge outlet over the top, stretching the field he created. I think it was the first goal in a moment like that, uh, the chip over the goalkeeper 
Corzo brings some of that to the left side, but also can come inside and beat players 1v1, which Finley doesn't do as much. And Lee Moore and Diego Fagundes is more of a connector inside. So I think he adds a new element to the attack. have no idea what it means about Cecilio Dominguez and the rest of Austin. But if you do have a DP spot held by a player who's not playing for you, and Redis has been a bit of a disappointment, you could do worse a than bit. bringing a player like this in on loan and still getting some production from that position while you sort of figure it out going into next year. Uh, Tom, feel free to answer any or none of this. Samwise the Fool hit us up, said, is the Crozo signing a signal that Austin is serious about a cup run this year? I'm not sure I would put it quite at that level, um, but it is a, certainly, as Dave said, an effort to reinforce and bring something a little different to the attacking side of the field. With the roster spot they can, there's another question from Jorge, which is what are Austin FC's realistic chances of landing a, quote, name DP to replace the one departing, thinking the name like the Lingard or Bale zone. Uh, the departing side, I would assume to be Cecilio, because mm -hmm. you have Ring, obviously, and then Driussi, who is an MVP candidate, mm -hmm. uh, obviously. Have you heard anything on Dominguez? And do you think Austin's the sort of team that would spend the type of money or attract the type of player that would be a, quote, name DP? I'm um, not sure in terms of the money in the name. Like They were extremely loosely linked with Chicharito um, before they got an MLS and before he came to the Galaxy, obviously. And it was pretty much just somebody in an interview said, yeah, we would love to sign Chicharito. <laughs> like there was, they weren't putting up the, the whatever 10 million transfer fee and the, however much he's getting paid in terms of salary over his contract. So I'd be surprised if that was kind of the route that they went. You know, look, they, they spent pretty heavily on Sebastian Dreyusi. He is their name guy. He is the, again, MVP candidate, elite player in this league. You couldn't ask for much more. And I'm, I'm not sure what else would you really want. Uh, in terms of outgoings, yeah. Look, Cecilio Dominguez was reinstated after a league investigation into domestic abuse um, early uh, a couple months ago. I think he, he was reinstated. Um, he hasn't played. Um, I'm assuming he's played his last game. I'm, I'm not reporting that. I just think that I'm not. I'm not sure what would have to change over the from then until now that he hasn't played that would make him you know be welcome back into the group or onto the field. It's obviously a, a touchy, fluid, sore situation. Um, in terms of just a cold cold kind of sporting sense, it'd be really beneficial for them if they could figure that out this summer so they could open another DP spot if they wanted to use it. But it was creative that, that they're getting this winger on loan that doesn't require a DP spot, and they're able so they're able to kind of effectively add another high-quality winger right now without maneuvering open a DP spot. So I guess that was creative how they were able to do that. Uh, we've got people comparing your reporting uh, stuck back in the corner of the Blair Witch Project, Tom. So I, I just want you to know that uh, before we let you go here. Uh, anything <laughs> else uh, on your mind that you're watching as the window is open? Uh, Gago Slanina is a name I would throw yeah. out there. Could St. Louis make any moves? Uh, anything you're thinking about or hearing? Yeah, I guess we'll go with Gaga. Um, Fabrizio Romano first reported this a few days ago that you know, there was there was a verbal agreement around 10 million US or 10 million euros with Chelsea for Sonina. Um, I've, I've heard that's accurate. Um, I've heard that, that the kind of the holdup right now is that Peter Cech also just left the Chelsea front office. That that's another key decision maker. And the holdup is will Chelsea honor or, you know, push through with this verbal agreement because nothing's been signed, nothing's been sorted in terms of Gago, signing Gago Sonina with again, I, I, I assume that means that Peter Cech was driving this deal. So I guess we'll wait and see on that one. But as I've been reporting for I don't know, a month, Chelsea has seemed like the most likely destination. I was told it was close, you know, a month ago. But then Chelsea had all the changes in the front office there. They've been trying to sign and, and reportedly have signed Raheem Sterling and some other players. They have a couple other high priority items other than an 18-year-old goalkeeper that they wouldn't expect to be starting for another couple of years. Tommy, I, I, my question to you is, you have Tati Cassianos. He's the golden boot defending Golden Boot champion and current Golden Boot leader. Why are we not hearing a number of clubs being linked to them? We heard Leeds. We heard Palmeiras back in, in some of the earlier earlier times. But this is a player who's who's complete. I mean, he, he's he's doing it all for New York City FC. And he's doing it with, with style and swagger. How, how are we hearing more names uh, clubs linked to, to his name? I don't know. Um it's, it's really surprising for me. Like, I know I sound biased, and we all probably do because we watch him every single week. We've, we've watched him grow. We've watched him become the player he is. So all of us probably think really, really highly of him. I think that $15 million is a no-brainer. I'm just not sure why a Premier League club, particularly with, with all the TV money, even an upper-end championship club, or if you're worried about it, like trying to really push for promotion, like 
Um, West Brom spent 10 million on Daryl DK. Like, why why could it not? Well, Tati Castellanos, 15 million is, is really fair. And I think that he comes into your team and makes your team better immediately. Um, another angle that I'm surprised about is, is so the Palmeiras bid was real and both, you know, for 4 million two years ago and then for 12 million in the winter that NYCFC rejected. The promise has been that he, you know, stay for 2021. We believe that we have a great team. They win. They, he wins a golden boot. They win MLS Cup. It's perfect. And then it was, hey, we're going to sell you in, in the next year. Didn't happen in the winter. Hasn't happened yet in the summer. I'm surprised that, say, City Football Group haven't stepped in and said, here's some money for, for Taddy the, the same way that Arsenal did with Austin Trusty, and now they're going to loan him out somewhere else. The same way City Football Group did with Jack Harrison before loaning him out, and now he's at Leeds. I'm just really shocked, really surprised, because I think that this guy is, is a really phenomenal player, somebody who would fit well in European soccer. I think that he would fit well in the Premier League. Just I know that last winter, it was last, yeah, over the winter, sorry, yeah, the, the six months ago, Burnley were the team that were most interested, but and opted to not sign him. Leeds didn't even explore it. I don't know if that, that has changed since Jesse Marshall's come. I know they were linked with him, but I haven't seen a lot of kind of big reporters reporting it, so I don't know how true everything was, and interest is always a big word. Who knows exactly what that means? So, look, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm as surprised as you, and, and, and it's pretty, you know, dumbfounded. All right, man. That's it. That's, I mean, 40 minutes with Tom, half of it with him on the phone, jammed in the back corner of his childhood room. It's, it's just been a wonderful, wild roller coaster ride with you, man. Follow him on Twitter, Tom Bogert. He is uh, breaking news at all times. He's the shams. He's the, he's the woge. He's the... He's the MLS uh, connector, so to speak. Thank you, Tom. We appreciate you, man. Oh, back to screen time for Tom. Feels like he's he's the shams of MLS. Is that about right? I mean, I'm not as plugged in as you are, Dave, to the NBA side of Twitter. Uh, but it feels like shams is winning the winning the war right now, and and definitely Tom is he's handling business when it comes to MLS news. I hope he's the shams at least on camera because Woj is just, uh, he's not the most eloquent speaker <laughs> when they put him on. I'll say that. Uh, but no, I don't know. Tom's killing it. Who else yeah. is in there then? Yeah, not that many. Not that many. Uh, you know, Tom and Tom and Paul used to be, or Sam and Paul used to be. You know, the rumors to our reports, etc. But uh, it feels like they've taken a little bit of a step back on that. Front. Are you Are you ready for me to out Sam? Sure. Sam's such a vacation guy. He actually was the first person to ever go on vacation to Hawaii. So congratulations to him for figuring that out. Uh, he didn't even know Gareth Bale had signed until like yesterday. Wow. Vacation guy you just got out in. Wow, Sam. Wow, you looked great in that suit though. What well done, man. Well done. Fit you like a glove. Uh all right, let's uh let's jump into the weekend. A lot of games. Obviously, the undercurrent to all of it is going to be the transfer window. It is the undercurrent to uh, El Trafico. LAFC LA 10 p.m. Eastern on Friday, ESPN, ESPN Deportes. Jimmy Conrad doing a watch along on Twitch as well as YouTube Live. The man is uh, the most incredible one-man entertainer that I've ever seen on those platforms. So that ought to be a really good time. We might see Giorgio Chiellini. It's looking quite doubtful to me that we're going to see Gareth Bale. I would put the odds on that, guys. Pretty darn low. I'm not even <laughs> sure that Gareth Bale is in L.A., so that would sort of be a, a, a starting point. You've got to be in the city to play a game in the city. Um, but maybe he'll be in the stands. Maybe he'll be in the owner's box. I, I don't know. Uh, TBD on that one. How anticipated is this El Trafico, Charlie? I don't think it can be the most anticipated of all time because that, that's got to be the Zlatan one, I would yes, think. for sure. Or I don't know if that's like, you know, revisionist it's, history because of what happened with Zlatan, but I remember yeah. Zlatan arriving and him like hitting the ground and be like, I'm playing. Don't I, worry I, about it. I will say, maybe before the game, knowing that Zlatan Ibrahimovic wasn't starting, Maybe took a little bit off of the 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 hype, but you still knew he was going to come into the game. Now, what transpired once he came into the match is incredible. That that's lightning in a bottle. Doesn't happen often. Almost impossible to to see this version of uh, of El Trafico coming up, overtaking it. But if Gareth Bale plays from the start, or even is is involved on the squad in the squad, Chiellini plays. This game could be. You know, it could be epic. However, I'm looking at the Galaxy side. It, it's a, a team that hasn't really given me confidence, and I don't think it's given anyone confidence. It's It's been up and down, very inconsistent. You know, you love that Jovalich is now partnered with, with Chicharito, and that has kind of given this team a little bit more. Uh, don't think I'll ever let you forget that you were that you were anti-Jovalich Chicharito when this first started. Yeah, I, I was. Because I didn't after see, dark, I didn't you, see much. 
But yeah, you didn't yeah, see it. I mean, players players can can get into a groove, which is what we've seen. And LA, <laughs> LAFC is is flying. So it's hard. It, I think it it'll be very hard for this one to overtake that 2018 one, which is is legendary. So, but the thing is with with LAFC even top of the table, signing Bale, signing Kalini, having an open DP spot open, it sort of still feels like Dave that the Galaxy. Like the, the the like the scale in El Trafico at least in the head to head side of the on field results still tips toward the galaxy. Am I off on that? No, it feels sort of like that original time where it was like LAFC has everything except that one piece which is dominating their rival or even being able to win. And I think um if I remember correctly, especially for the open cup game, it was a level of intensity and um, grit to the galaxy that LAFC couldn't match. And obviously Vela goes out early in that game and it ends with a bit of a shoving match and Julian Araujo is doing laps around, um, you know, the stadium waving the Jersey and all those things. Those are all moments where it feels like now we've entered a new era of different coaches for the most part, different players outside of Vela on both sides. And yet there is still this moment where the galaxy are able to up their level against LAFC and LAFC have something internally that they don't play as free as they do against the galaxy uh, than they do against every other opponent. Uh, let's play a game here. And we don't know who's going to play in this. One. We don't know the, the role Chiellini is going to play that a Bale will play, etc. cetera. Uh, let's play the Gareth Bale over under game. Uh, and this is all set by producing Anders. We, we figured out 16 games remaining in the regular season, plus three or four in the postseason. LAFC will be there. Plus the league's cup showcase. Very important. So you're looking at maybe like 20, 21 games max that Gareth Bale could participate in. Games played over under 12 and a half. What do you think, Charlie? I think over. How many do you think you'll get? Mm, 13. You smashing the over too? <laughs> yeah. Dave? Thir- thir- I don't know. You asked him a question, then you asked him a second question. You, you I, said, I did. I said the over. I said, how many do you think you get? I, I, I think in terms of games played, Gareth Bale – starts 13 you think he starts Ooh, we had we had games started also at 12 and a half from producing under so you're over you're double over two yeah. overs so i think starts and games played are over 13 or, or 13 or or more this you remember right this is a guy who has not played week in and week out in over a year yes i'm gonna go i'm gonna go over on that as well and i think most of those come at the end, but I think Charlie's right to sort of to put to put both of the lines like r- really close to the uh, to the twelve and a half, like 13, 14 games per- participated in. So I think I'm probably definitely going under on starts. Yeah, that's, that that's, like I was going to say that's one. probably yeah. the, the safer of the you two. You think Gareth Bale starts. is just going to be coming in as a substitute? I don't think Stop he's going to play Stop sixty it. to eighty minutes most games. He hasn't. So why would you not work him in to make him comfortable? It's not about Gareth Bale not being good enough or anything. It's about making sure he's not injured. And that's sort of where you're at right now from the starting point. What's the – are we doing production off? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, goals, seven and a half, over or under, Dave? Over. I think he might eviscerate MLS. I'm, I'm not gonna, sure. I'm going to go with over as I well. think there's a decent I'm chance. I'm going to go over. I'm going to take just, – just to have some balance here, I'm going to take the under – even though I th- I think you're right that there is a very good possibility if he's healthy that he could just be absolutely we're dominant. we're we're going off of he we think he's going to be healthy yes correct okay goals we're going his... off of he has to be healthy for Wales on November correct 15th. <laughs> yeah that that's what this but that also goes to what Dave is talking about which is there has to be some sort of agreement I would think between Gareth and the LFC coaching staff that in addition to the sporting goals of LAFC, that that is the sporting goal of Gareth Bale. That anything that would put his participation in the World Cup at risk, load management, etc., however you want to put it, is probably out of the realm of possibility because this is still a team that is top of the table without him. So I would think there are, there's some sort of intimate understanding between Gareth Bale and Steve Trundle and LAFC about how they'll use him and what he is building up his body for. Have you ever thought of this side of the, of the Gareth Bale um, coming to LAFC saga, which is 
all the American players who play on the national team will now get a chance to see the level of Gareth Bale, considering he will be playing for Wales. So there's not that element of surprise anymore or that, oh my God, it's Gareth Bale. It's, we've seen him in MLS. We know what he does. We know his, 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 his tendencies. We know how, what his top speed is. We, we are much more comfortable defending a Gareth Bale now than we would have been had he stayed in the premiership and, and we're seeing him for the first time in Qatar. Have you considered, Charlie, that Gareth Bale came to MLS to scout Aaron Long and Walker Zimmerman and Paul Areola no, and Jesus Ferrer? Absolutely not. Have you considered? No, no chance. Have you thought the Welsh, about the, the Welsh FA has put together a 14-year plan to both qualify <laughs> for the World Cup, draw the United States, and plant a mole in the camp in Major League Soccer? Who, who do you think benefits That's what this more? All been been. Jesse Lingard? Yeah, what a coincidence. Look at me, Jesse Lingard. I want to play for England, so I go to mm, MLS. I feel like it's more Jack Price that I would. Didn't he come from uh, come from like uh, Swansea or Cardiff or, or something like that? So Jack Price, he they was got a him. Whole player. Oh, All well, I know is almost. it's going to benefit the the U.S. Men's National Team defenders and midfielders getting a, a look at Gareth Bale for sure. There's no over under goals and that assists. That is their best best way forward. Eleven and a half over under goals and assists. Goals go and over. assists. I'm already going over. And I'm goals going and over. Assists. Over. Yeah. All right. Well, we boy, we I'm fascinated to see how Gareth Bale performs and how uh, what his role is. Hak Tata hit us up and said Chirundolo should have been talked about more as a coach of the year front runner. Yes, the squad floor has been raised, but be able to get the most out of this group, rotating without much drop off, making impactful subs and motivating big names deserves praise. What do you think? Trundle for coach of the year. I don't think we really talked him up too much on that on Monday. No, I mean, oh, I, if you're saying right we, now. Well, we mentioned him as one of the three finals, yeah, yeah, well, right? Yeah, that's true. As, as of that. right now, yeah, he's a, he's he's up there. But we all know how, how, how seasons can change at, at the drop of a hat. So, yes, he's been incredible so far. But you got to continue that to the end of the to the end of the season. And on top of that, figuring out a way to incorporate some of these world world stars into your group without taking away from your group, but also keeping everybody moving in the same direction. There's a lot of, of conversations that have to take place. There's a lot of, of pleasing. There's a lot of making people adjust uh, and playing them out of position. There's a lot that goes into it. You see, you know, when you think of Latif blessing saying, Hey, I'm unhappy yet. The team's in first place. You're getting all this hype and bringing in these top players. And you have a player who's, making it publicly known that he's unhappy uh, how selfish that, is that, that so, he said he says that was more about his family though charlie but you are right in the sense that they're going to have to make some moves to get roster compliant it seems yeah i would say well. it was my family too if i had that type of blowback but ultimately what i'm telling you is as a manager you have to there's a lot that goes into it and most of it is man management not necessarily the tactics that's the tactics is easy that's the part we see Oh, you played him there. You used this formation. You rotated here or you rested these players. But behind the scenes, hey, Chicho Arango, I know you're doing it. You're not playing today. Gareth Bale is at the nine. And, and that's how – and he's on a tear. We're not moving him. Carlos Vela is on one side. Unfortunately, you're not going to play as much as you, as you want to. Having those conversations but still keeping him in – without trading him, but keeping him motivated. that That's the things that you wouldn't see as a fan that go on behind the scenes. And then maybe Arango's tight with certain players and you, you start hear, hearing this chatter, but keeping everyone feeling involved, that's where Tarundolo has to really shine. And if this team is still playing at the same level, if not better, come the end of the year, you might as well put give him a medal. For, for for being able to, to keep this together and keep this group moving forward and to keep guys LA, healthy. LAFC, Galaxy, El Trafico, ESPN, second of a doubleheader. Uh, DC Philly is the other one, 10 p.m. Eastern for that big match on ESPN. That's Friday night, Saturday. Uh, let's talk Seattle, Portland on Big Fox, Cascadia, always a huge game. Who does it mean more for, Dave, this particular version of Cascadia? Uh, I'd say right now for Portland, and I think Gio Savarese's comments this week sort of said it of, it's an embarrassment for us 
that Seattle was the first to win CCL, right? This is this is a region where Portland won MLS Cup first, and then Seattle followed it up immediately. Like they are always going back and forth. Seattle has now taken that step that no one else in MLS has taken, but especially reflects on their their regional rival. Um, and so Portland, outside of that, they've had a bad season. If they haven't even been in the playoff conversation most of the year. Diego Valeri's gone, so some of the big names are gone as well. Who does this team now rely on? You've talked a little bit about, uh, we've talked a little bit about rumors around Gio Savarese. And maybe is this sort of the end of this error of the team? If they move on now from Valeri, but then from Blanco and Steve Clark's out, and potentially Diego Chara one day, does Savarese go with that? And it's a whole rebuild. So I think for the Timbers to on national TV and rivalry week, sort of put together a legitimate performance and they're undefeated in their last four. Um, but they haven't won a road game yet uh, in that span. If they can do that against the Sounders, I think that sort of sends a message around the league. So David Spindola and many Timbers fans have noticed we're not talking much about uh, Portland this year. Charlie, do you have any, any general thoughts about the season so far? I guess my biggest thought would be, you know, they're in that they're in a transition moment. It seems like from a roster perspective and Diego Valeria was one of the first um, and very obvious, sort of like, okay, it's time to part ways. It, it sort of feels like trying to get another year to Sebastian Blanco was a mistake. It's not that he's not still an incredible player. It's just that he can't be as incredible as often and have the same influence on this team as he had in the last couple years. Obviously, injuries have been a massive part of their season, so that's you know that's part of what's holding them back. But it just sort of feels like they're in this transition phase, whether it be coaching, whether it be their number 10, whether it be their stars – Nishgoda and Mora, um, you know, you'd hope Williamson is part of that transition and Santiago Moreno and hell, maybe Diego Chara is as well. But you look at the center back position, like Mabiala is not going to be there forever. Uh, what do you think about, about 2022 in Portland so far coming off an MLS Cup hosting appearance? Disappointing is, is the word that comes to mind. I, I look at this group and, you know, I, I think you, you, you talked about it perfectly. You look at the striker position. Niesh Goda, you know, has a ACL injury, come, came back. It, is he the right fit? Felipe Mora. It feels like both of them had been competing and never consistently are doing it on scoring goals. You, you get hard work from them, but is that what you want if you're the Portland Timbers? If you're looking across um, at your rivals and you see, you know, Ladero in the midfield and you could say Blanco's the equivalent for for Portland, but up top, Rui Diaz, he's in another stratosphere if you're comparing him to Nishkoda and, and Mora. And then Moreno and Espria, I feel like Espria has been Espria has been more of a, a super sub for this group. I wouldn't say he he's a he's a flat out starter. If if you, this is the Portland Timbers that are trying to compete for for a championship, you know Diego Chara has always been good, but he's getting up there in, in age. Uh, Eric Williamson, I've always thought he's been uh, an incredible, young, talented player. Coming back from injury, still has time to to, to kind of recover, rediscover his form. But that's another player that you can say, hey, we want to build around him. The rest of the group, uh, man, from from Bingham to to you know, uh, Bravo, Van Rankin, McGraw, Mabiala, uh, Zuperich. Uh, you know, I'm like, no one that I'm saying, hey, I guess you could say Mabiala is a beast on set pieces and you just got to, his center back partner has to really work with him. But uh, I, I am I am really down on this Portland Timber side because I'm not seeing progress. I'm not seeing any progress. And, and in terms of bringing in players that are going to build that hype and, and get fans motivated that you can compete for, for MLS Cup, I'm just not seeing it. Am I wrong? Would you say I'm wrong? I I don't think you're wrong. I, I will say I, I do think Santiago Morena is a legitimate piece for the future, and he has shown that this year, that he can be a difference maker in the attack right now. And he's a guy you build around. Uh, I think Williamson's in there. They're starting to push David Ayala into the team. I So I think you're starting to, to have that succession plan for um, Diego Chara. And I think Tui, Tui Loma has been pretty good this year as well um this is not to they're not in the playoffs right now none of those guys i don't think maybe outside of williamson are going to be all-stars in the future 
I just I th- I'm probably a little more positive on Santiago Moreno than you. That's all. Uh, all right, let's hit the other uh, rivalry games on Saturday, uh, and hit the mailbag and get out of here. Uh, we're going to be with you for the uh, the last three games of the night on Saturday. Charlie, Sasha, Kleshin, and Tom. Uh, feel free to jump in there. Ask Tom any transfer question you want. Try to get stories out of Sasha and Charlie, and uh, I'll try to referee the whole thing. It starts with Orlando, Miami at 8 p.m. Eastern. All these on MLS Live on ESPN Plus, and it's Houston, Dallas. Uh, at 8.30, that could be Ache Ache's debut, and then RSL Colorado on the Rocky Mountain Cup ends us at 10 p.m. We'll be with you through all those games. Who finishes higher in the standings, Dave, Orlando or Miami, and how crazy it is that we can realistically ask that question? It's wild. It's also really hard. Um, it feels like Miami's trending up while Orlando's trending down, even with the Open Cup semifinal. Uh, I just even though Miami has been so much better defensively, I still don't have full trust in the ability of that back line to defend 1v1. And Orlando has held their ground without Antonio Carlos, who's now back, who I think is one of the best center backs in Major League Soccer. So for as many holes and as many issues as Orlando has, I think they're already starting from here. And the question is, Pasuelo enough for Miami to catch up? Uh, I feel safer picking Orlando right now. I am uh, very interested to see what Miami looks like, but I don't think we'll see Pozuelo in this game based on those visa issues that Tom was talking about. Uh, What should we expect from Ace Ace, Charlie? How much should be on his shoulders as far as expectations go? I think we should expect the player who's going to come in and and help this team try and win games. But in terms of creating turning them in from – an 11th place team, which are now on the table to uh, a, a real competitive team in the playoffs. I would not place that type of, uh, I guess, pressure on him. Yes. He's going to help them, but they still have to bring in some pieces to, to really move up the needle in, in terms of being a, a team that's going to compete for a cup. Can they get to the seventh place spot? Yes. But I think that's like, that's, Best case scenario, if you're putting, if you're putting Ache, ceiling Ache on seventh for them, I, I'd say seventh is their ceiling. All right, with Ache, we will Ache. see. Any thoughts on Ache, Ache Dave? Uh, I hope he plays. I hope he starts. I doubt he will. I think it'd be. I mean, you know, I'm really off the ex- bench. Probably, yeah, I'm really excited about this one. Just we were in there in that stadium for an Open Cup final. That building bounces when there's excitement. We saw it when Chicharito made his debut for the Galaxy uh, in that stadium. So I'm excited to add that experience in that market to Copa de Tejas's this week because then they go to Austin on Tuesday night. So it's an awesome way to start it. I'm really high on what he can bring in MLS and I'm really high on the way that midfield's going to be built. And now you're going to dominate possession, I think, in every game that they play, especially at home when teams don't really know how they want to play in that heat in the summer. Uh, and I think that's exciting with him and Coco Karaskia and maybe Vera. It also, uh, I think, helps you Use Quintero in specific spots and not be overly reliant on him, which is a dangerous thing. And Sebas Ferreira is pouring yeah, in goals. To... When he gets chances, he scores goals. Uh, I think it's seven goals, three assists now on the year with a team that has struggled offensively. So I, I agree with Charlie. The expectation shouldn't be there, but the possibility to make the playoffs is definitely there. And I'm excited to watch them play. Uh, last one on the night, RSL Colorado. Uh, Looking to just get a little bit more from the Rapids, uh, but on the road at RSL where the crowds have been absolutely brilliant this year. They've got some injury issues, but they've been working through them. Should be a really fun end to uh, Saturday night. So tune in for that. Uh, Tune in to the watch-alongs in the mailbag. We have uh, Jim Kim saying, if the future DM'd you and let you know that one of the transfer window signings will be hoisting MLS Cup, but they're not named Bale or Kalini, which signing or team would be your best guess? Yeah, big. Yeah, yeah maybe you know, Cardozo or uh, Carozo in Austin. You could throw out there. Maybe Savarino in Salt Lake. I'm trying to think who else would be a big one. I, I think Toronto probably out of the realm of possibility. Charlie might be your guy. Giacomo, Rioni. What do you think? Could, could be. be. Could be could history be. for the Revs. What do you think about that signing? We haven't asked you about it. I think it's a it's a massive signing. They had to replace Adam Buxa. And I would say, I'd argue that this is a copy-paste almost in a way. Similar stature, left-footed, can shoot from distance, pretty good in the air. I'd say he's probably better with his feet, and and Adam Buxa probably has the edge in the air. 
but ultimately you're getting a player who's who's comfortable on the ball. He has that Juve uh, club name attached to, to his CV. If he performs at a high level, you, you really have a good chance to resell him at a, at a high high number. So I, I like this move. And he talked about Adam Books of being a, a perfect example of coming to MLS, performing well, and being sold into Europe, back to Europe at a, at a bigger club, which is, I think, something that he's really interested in. So that's great to see that you can come here to develop perform at a high level and still, you know, reach your dreams if, if that's the case. So I think it's a fantastic signing and you, you just hope that he hits the ground running. I'm taking Jesse Lingard wherever he ends up for that MLS yeah. Cup one. Just saying. <laughs> where, wherever he ends up. I don't know where it'll be. If he ends up at LAFC, though, then you're not allowed that's to. That's true. That's true. There's nothing There's nothing that people hate more uh, than lionizing LAFC before they've won a cup-shaped trophy. All right, we're out of here. 4120060 MLS, as always, the best way is to hit us up on Twitter to get your mail into the show. We'll see you on Monday, everybody. Enjoy Heineken Rivalry Week and the transfer window. Ought to be a crazy one. Adios. Congratulations. You made it through more than an hour of extra time. That means you love the show. And if you love the show, you probably want more episodes. Click right here for more episodes of extra time and here to subscribe to the MLS YouTube channel. Thanks for following along.